All right, everybody. All right, everybody. I got a guy on my channel. He ready to go. He called me and said, come on, man. Where you at? I said, hey, <laughs> hold on, man. We ain't got another 20 minutes. He said, no, man. Come on, let's get it on. And this brother came on early. Man, every now and then that happens. People are so excited that they can share this Black history with you. My friends, you know who I am. I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm a guy who came up with this idea. And then I do the interviews. And let me tell you something, my friends. I like doing this. I really do. I, I You know, every now and then you come up with an ideal and you be like, wow, man, I wish I'd have thought about that a while ago. This is one of those. Because see, I've been talking about Black history for a while in some form or fashion. I mean, let me give you an example. Back in 1994, 1994, I had a Black History Month event here, and I, I, you all know I'm in Detroit, where I had these all these Black businessmen. Uh, they were in their 80s, 70s, and 80s at the time, and they all had own businesses. And I had them on a panel, and they talked about what it was like owning the business and they probably could go back to almost the 50s. And man, we had a packed house. And I don't know where I came up with the idea, but I did. It was just me doing this. So I've been talking Black history for a long time. And I got a brother on the channel that watch out. He going to blow your mind. I'm telling you, you, be, you need to be ready. And so uh, hit the subscribe button. And oh man, watch out. I had about... Mm, maybe a 50 new subscribers last night. That's my biggest one night gain so far. 50 people hit the button. I don't know what happened. And when I saw it this morning, I said, whoa, I'm on to something. So let's do it again. I want you to like this video because you're going to really appreciate what this brother going to share with you. You're going to appreciate that he's sharing this and he's going to inspire you and all that other good stuff. I want you to hit the notifications bell because I, I put the videos up every now and then. I got one I'm putting up tonight. I got one I'm putting up tonight. So whenever this air, whenever the night is, it might be another one that's going up when you watch it. But there's one coming up tonight. I want you to tell somebody about Strong Inspirations. I had a sister hit me up with an email. She said, hey, she want to meet a guy who knows strong inspirations. I said, oh, what city you in? She told me the city. I said, well, I, I got people in that city. So she said, hey, if a brother knows something about strong inspirations, he might have a shot. <laughs> I said, girl, what you want me to do with that information? I can't do nothing with it. But it was funny. And she, and she was serious. She liked this kind of Black history stuff that you conscious, that you want to know this. And the other thing is, as you might know, I'm a filmmaker. I'm serious about this. I've been doing this Black history. This right here came out in 2017. It's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. Slaves who went to college, Black millionaires in the 1800s, slaves who owned businesses, slaves who bought their freedom. 75 minutes long. You ain't going to sleep on this one. You watch that and you be like, whoa, I need more. And how about this? The movie start and end with a guy who was 101 years old at the time. All right? You need to watch this. Uh, it's streaming on Amazon. That's the DVD. And I got some DVDs still that you can get one. And then I wrote the book. This is it. This is my baby right here. It's called Black Business Book. It's got over 200 facts. I'm telling you, this is the real deal. The real deal, Holyfield, you want to? Let me tell you how much I believe in this book. You ever heard of this? If you read this book and you don't learn nothing new, I give your money back. <laughs> I tell you that smart that all these 200 facts, none of them in, that you that you you are you already heard them all over. And you know the names of these people that I mentioned and the businesses that I mentioned. If you got all that, I give your money back. Buy, get you a copy of my book. I autograph it. And then every 10th book I sell, I donate one to a school. So in, in, in September, when them schools start back, I got books to donate. 
I, I, I want people to know this information. So get you a copy of my book, my friends. Um, I, I really appreciate that because that, that's kind of how I make my living. You know, I'm out here, I'm a businessman and I'm giving you this history for free. It mean that much to me. So come on, brother. Uh, 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 cause you, you waiting, man, you, you standing there, you smiling. You say, come on, man, give me, come on. Let, no, I ain't gonna let you come on just yet. I got one more thing to say. I use that word strong a lot. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that's what I got. A strong brother. Come on, introduce yourself. That's the introduction. Well, my name is Desi, uh, L Campbell. Uh, and I am in the little town called Lillington, North Carolina, uh, which is between Fayetteville and Raleigh, halfway between Fayetteville and Raleigh. Uh, I am a music educator in the Harney County Schools. I am a genealogist. I am a researcher. I've written several books, actually nine books about my family history uh, and other families that I've been uh, able to work with over the few years. And I am excited about what I'm doing here today with um, this young man. <laughs> He's very excited. So I'm gonna try to get as excited as he is. <laughs> oh yeah, you're already there, but hold on. Let me, uh, sometimes every now and then uh, something pop up, I kind of uh, interrupt you. Uh, oh, you. You from that town? I'm actually uh, originally from Washington, DC. My parents are from this area. They're from Harney County. And, and, where, and where is it again, did you say? It's in between Raleigh and Fayetteville, North Carolina. Okay, yeah, I'm familiar with them. So it, is, is it a, a predominantly black town or what's the matter? Uh, no, it's, mm, it's a little half and half, I guess. Oh, really? Is, is, there, a, is there some black history note in that town? That's There's something that happened? There's tons of black history here in this town. Um, I actually moved here from Charlotte. Um, I, you know, my, both my parents are from this area and I was often coming here to do different black history events and different things. So uh, about three years ago, I decided I would move here. Now I'm from the city and I said, I would never live in the country. However, I am living in the country and I, you know, as I got older, I guess I can appreciate the country more. And I really enjoy being down here in the country. So it's it's a rural city. Yes, it's a rural area. Yes. And and and, and uh, but you got neighbors. It's not that. Not that. It's not bad. that rural. It's not that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not that rule. bad. I actually live in Fayetteville, um, but okay. my businesses are in 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 Hardy County. Yeah. Now, 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 what what's a what's a Black History story that happened there? There's so many Black history stories that happen here. Um, if you are familiar with the North Carolina slave narratives, there is one slave narrative in particular of a James Turner McLean. Uh, and he was the slave, uh, his parents and him were the slave of a set of twins, Hugh and Hector McLean. Um, <clears throat> That is a very interesting story. So if you ever want to you know, read his story, you can go into North Carolina Slave Narratives and it's, it will it actually has a whole passage of what he said to uh, an interviewer. And, 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 and when did this happen? What's the time frame? Uh, he was born around 1850 something. I think the interview uh, took place in the 1920s. Ah. There's a lot of interesting African-American facts here in Harnett County. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about will, will kind of uh, lead into that. Um, my, family is, my family is huge, um, and I was able to track my family back uh, pretty far um, using things like deeds and wheels of uh, some of the slave owners. Um, so we'll talk, you know, we get into that. Yeah. So, so how long you been doing? How long, how long you been doing this kind of research? I've been doing this kind of research for about 20, 25 years. Um, oh, really? My parents, you know, we by us growing growing up in DC, my parents, you know, were from here, but they would bring us to North Carolina, and you know, I knew my father's siblings, you know, the ones that were alive, and I knew all, you know, their children, and that's pretty much the extent of the people that I knew. I would see other people like when we had reunions. I kind of never knew who those people were or how they were related to me. And as I got older, I was always inquisitive. But as I got older, 
I realized that um, I wanted to, you know, figure out who these people were. I started, when I went to college, I started meeting people. Some of them had my last name um, and some of them, you know, didn't, but come to find out that we were some kind of relation, related in some way. So we basically, um, you know, were cousins. And so I started kind of researching and researching and trying to figure yeah. out um, my information. So fortunately during that time, this was probably in the, er, the mid 90s, 93, 94, 95, all the way up to about 90, 2001, 2000. Uh -huh. I would come to, to Harnett County from Charlotte and spend a Saturday down here. And I would talk to some of the older people that were in their 90s. And they were here and they would tell me all these stories about things that happened back during their time and even before their time that it was passed down from family. So I was able to use that information and kind of trace my family and put it back together. Yeah. Let me ask you this, man. And, and maybe you can answer this. And, and I guess it's kind of been on my mind. Uh, is everybody Black? No. Is everybody who's lighter complected Black person? <laughs> listen to me. Uh -huh. Do they have, they got, we got, we all got to have some weight in our family, don't we? Basically, uh, if there, with the DNA, um, the DNA kind of tell a lot of the stories, like some of my great, great, great uncles and aunts, you know, they, they, their descendants took the DNA test, but they'll show up as a half cousin. So that means they had a different parent. And, and if you look at the half, that line, that whole line, a lot of them were light skinned. Okay, so in them, short, in short, I'm light skinned because I know somewhere down the line, Somebody had relationship with a black woman, or it's, or vice versa. Talking. Well, in the in down here, a lot of a lot of uh, people in North Carolina, for whatever reason, tend to think that they are Native American, um, and that's mostly not true. Most of the time, it's just you mix with you, you got some kind of mix with black and white. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking because I, I I think cause my mother had nice long hair. Uh, she was kind of a caramel complexion. But I think I remember her telling me that um, maybe great, great, great grandfather was a white guy. And that, that's possible. That's very possible. Yeah. Was there, uh, there was a lot of, in, of the white guys getting with the black women. There's yes. a ton of that, isn't there? Yeah, especially down here in the South. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, and, and, and not all of it was rape, though. No, it wasn't. That I, I've heard there were some instances or that the black women thought that if they could get with the white guy, that would help them out. That would help out their plight. And that may be true. I don't know that part. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've heard that though. That's very possible. But I yeah, that part I don't you, know. You never you so you never heard that. So no. so let me ask you this then. When you do your your research. When you find the white family, in most instances, are they receptive to want to talk about this or not? Okay, so that's one thing that I want to go through. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, let's get it on. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so I, uh, well, it's not just me. It's actually uh, one other person. Um, when I first took the DNA test, I looked at it. And I, I was confused. I didn't know who none of these people were. Um, so it took me, you know, a couple of months to try to figure out how this is, how to work this. So probably like a year after I took the test, I got an email from a lady saying, hey, you, you match with quite a few people in my family. And not only do you match, but a lot of people that you manage also match with those same people. And I said, okay. So when we looked at, when I looked at her family, I was like, I don't know who these people are. And they were, now they were black. They were black, right? No, they actually were white. Oh, really? You're white. And so I did not have a clue how, you know, who these people were. But me and her uh, worked together for like six months or to a year to try to figure out how we were related. Because however we were related, it was very close. So what we found out was that her great-great-great-grandmother and my great-great-grandfather were brothers and sisters. Oh. So what happened with her was, her great 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 grandmother had a child by a slave owner. She got pregnant by a slave owner. The original slave owner uh, came back and got her and took her to Missouri. 
She ended up in Missouri. She had a child, uh, according to his children, the, the mother, you know, from what he told them, the mother died shortly after she was born, or he was born. So uh, he was raised by the slave owner's mother. Um, being, and he was mulatto, so, you know, he, that was, he could get away with that. And then they were in Missouri. So I'm not sure what slavery was like in Missouri during that time. But that, when they say mulatto, that's what they mean. Black, one parent, white, one black, for the most part. Yes, sir. Right. And so when she died, he, he, um, he ran away and he ended up in Kansas. And when he got in Kansas, he ended up with a man named uh, Colonel Ritchie. So Colonel Ritchie took him in and obviously took in the whole family. So he's and young at this age, you think? He's young at this age, yes. So Colonel Ritchie took him in and obviously some of his siblings that we later found out about and maybe even some of his cousins that we found out about later on. So took him in. So his name was Nelson Holder. And the reason he was a Holder because that's who owned him at the time. So his name ended up being Nelson Holder Ritchie. Well, Nelson Holder Ritchie ended up in Kansas and he ended up very, he was very um, productive. He uh, owned quite a bit in Kansas, in Topeka, Kansas. He did a lot. He married a lady. He had, I think it was 11 or 12 kids. Of course, uh, they look, some of them look mixed. Some of them look, you know, white. And, and then two generations down, we were able to connect and make the connection between our family and theirs. So probably about four, three, four years ago, three or four years ago, I went to Utah. I, that's where they actually, they left Topeka, Kansas in probably 1840, 50, somewhere in there. Uh, well, probably 1850, 60, somewhere in there. They left Kansas and went to Utah. And they became Mormons, okay? So if you know anything about the Mormon religion, they are very adamant about their genealogy. Right. We went to Utah. He met, got married. Uh, I think he got married before he got to Utah, but he had kids. So his grandkids, a couple of his grandkids were still living, you know, a few years ago, and they took the DNA test. So we was able to connect and figure out our family connection. So we basically have the same great, we basically have the same fourth great grandparent. All right. We have the same fourth great grandparent. Uh, and I went to Utah and met with them. I actually went to Roots Tech, which was a uh, genealogy conference uh, that they sponsored there. The Mormon church actually sponsors in Utah. And I met with uh, part of the family, uh, one, actually one family in particular, the Picaro family. I met with them. That's my cousin, Dina. Okay, hold on. Let me start. Now, they're white. They're white, yes. And you called them up and said, hey, well, they got in touch with me. I didn't call them. They called me. They got in touch with me. Oh. And we connected. I've been out there twice. I met most of the family. They had a family reunion uh, with the descendants of Nelson Holder Ritchie, probably right before the pandemic in the fall, I believe it was. And I went out there and I met with them. And it was it, it was like we've been knowing each other all our lives. And really? We, it was a very, very great relationship. We still have a great relationship. And I mean, all of them are accepting to what, you know, what happened. You know, my family, they've been here for, they came here twice. They came, or some of them came for one of the family reunions. Uh, and then they came for an event we had. Uh, we were planning last year to have a family reunion uh, of all of our DNA cousins that could come. Um, and they, uh, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do that. Right. We're doing the same thing this year, of course, that didn't happen either. So hopefully next year we'll be able to pull all of our, you know, white, black, and uh, cousins together to have one big family. Um, and me and her name is Dina Hill. And Dina and I have been really able to pull, and mind you, this family was broke up so bad. Uh, you know, from the start of slavery. So Dina is like a genius when it comes to doing the, looking at the wheels and the probates of these slave owners. So what we did was we tried to find out, hey, who, who had our people? Luckily, we were able to, the, the slave owner was actually living right beside one of our family members in the 1870s. Really? So, and they had the same last name. We were McNeils at that time. So Dina started looking through the McNeil family. So what she did was she pretty much put the whole white McNeil family 
together, back together again. So most of them came to the Cumberland County area around 1750, 1760, somewhere in there. So she was able to go that far back on their family. So then she started looking at the wills and the probate records of those people. And throughout that whole family line, the McLeans and the McNeils and the Clarks and a few other connecting uh, white families, we were able to trace our family all the way back to 1775 with, wow. Joe, with Joe and Jenny McLean. The interesting thing was one of them was still living in 1870. And it said that her mother or her mother was born in Africa and her father was born in Virginia or vice versa. Um, so that let us know that basically our family started, you know, from Africa, probably around 1750 and coming to the United States. We can't trace the ship yet, but we can at least know that they somewhere between 1750 and 1770, that's when they came to the United States. Let, 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 let me ask you this. What, yes, what, what, what kind of record do you see when you see this? You see a, a, a photocopy of uh, actual something that happened in or what what, yes, what does it look like? So, like if if doing the doing even now, you can go to the, the, the register of deeds. So if we look up uh, Archibald McLean, so Archibald McLean was one of the guys that owned quite a bit of our family. So if Archibald McLean died in 1820, he had a will, most likely, um, because they were people of wealth. So if he had a will, in his will, he would list his slaves and who he's giving his slaves to. Most of the time he was passing them down to his children or his grandchildren or his you know, brother or his sister or some cousins. So it would literally list the slave in the wheel. So we were able to find these slaves and you know, figure out where they belong in our tree. So Jenny and Joe McLean were born around 1775 uh, and they had from what we can gather, they had about 13 kids. We, and, and we, none of these kids probably even, a lot of them were sold off to other people. So Jenny and Joe were McLean's, but most of their children were McNeil's, okay? So they were passed down to the McNeil family. Um, and so we were able to connect with those McLean's and those McNeil's through those wheels. Some of them had probate records. Uh, some of them were inventory records. I mean, they were listed, you know, clear as day. Blank, blank, blank went to so and so. So we found out if if Joe went to um, if Joe went to John McLean, then if John McLean, if this is 1820, he went to John McLean. But if John McLean died in 1840, then we're gonna find his will and find out who Joe to who who he sent Joe to. Mm. So we were able to connect all those people together. So with all of that, we've been able to put two generations of 13 kids back together. Wow. Um, and, and the interesting thing is, it's just not, they were not just in North Carolina. A lot of these children ended up in uh, Mississippi, which is a strong, we have a very strong connection to Mississippi. Um, there is a place called Buckatona, Mississippi which is in, uh, what county is that? I forgot the county, but Buckatona, Mississippi, uh, Newton County, Mississippi. We have a very strong connection to that area uh, with the McLeans and the McNeils and a few other families that we've been trying to figure out, you know, how we're connected to them, but they are close relatives to us. That Some of the DNA matches are like second and third cousins and fourth mm -hmm. cousins, meaning that we are pretty close but we just don't know how. And it's got to be through one of those slave owners. They have the same surname as we do. We just don't know who connects with who. Um, we got people in uh, the Nelsons. They ended up in Arkansas. There's a group of Murchisons that ended up in Arkansas. And all these people came from North Carolina. Uh, there's a group of people that, came, that ended up in Tennessee. So we do know that a lot of the McLeans and the main names here in Harney County, slave owners was McLean, McNeil, Smith, Elliott, Murchison, Clark, McCraney, McDougal, Harrington, uh, and Campbell. So my family pretty much on both sides, my grandmother and my grandfather, 
they they were all when you look at their slave owners they they either the slave owners were related to each other or they were married into each other's family therefore all of these slaves got mixed up with each other wow it's kind of hard to figure out who belong who belongs to who because my grandmother's people were smiths and elliots and they were also mcneils uh, but they were a different set of mcneils however the people that own both sets, we think may have been related. Wow. But, you know, so it's, it's been quite interesting. Do, do you, um, uh, uh, I had a question. Do you, when you when you see this, do, 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 is there any uh, amazing stories that you found in your family? Like somebody did something, you know, where he escaped? Or do you see that kind of information? Any escapes? that I can think of, that I can remember rather. Um, but what I have seen is, okay, so my great, great, my fourth great grandmother was Sarah McNeil. Uh, we assumed that she was probably Sarah McLean because her parents were McLean's, but somehow she, she was sold to the McNeil, so she became a McNeil. Her husband, or who we think, well, we, her husband, we believe his name was Sherd or Sherrod. And the reason we think that was his name because a lot of her children had their sons, their first sons were named Sherrod. And then she had a child named Sherrod so, or Sherd. So those names were very strong in our family. Well, <laughs> Sherd and Sarah had a son named Gabriel. This is very strange or interesting. They had a son named Gabriel. I come from Gabriel. So Gabriel would be my third great grandfather. Right. Gabriel married a Caroline McLean who was owned by the same McLean's that owned us in the original part, okay? So Caroline and Gable, they weren't related, but they, you know, they was on the same, probably on the same plantation at some point in time. So Gabriel had 12 kids by Caroline, as far as we know. The last child was born around 1863. So Caroline in 1870 was married. In 1880, she was married, but there was no Gable. <laughs> We could not find Gabriel anywhere, uh, nowhere to be found. But we knew he was the father because on all of their death certificates, it says Gabriel and Caroline. So what do you assume happened there? Oh, I, th we found out what happened. So yeah. I had a DNA match that I've been trying to figure out who was very close connected to me. I think it was a third cousin, second or third cousin. And I was like, well, I can't figure out how this person connects to me. But guess where they were? They were in Florida. Well, after looking at it for about a year, I realized that they had a Gabriel in their tree. But I knew that Gabriel was there, but I didn't put two and two together because Gabriel was not a McNeil. At that time, he was Gabriel Bacchus. Born around the same time my Gabriel was born. Okay. And I said, that may be the same Gabriel. So we figured out that is the same Gabriel. So his name became Gable Backers at some point between 1863 and 1870. In 1870, he was in Florida. When he was in Florida, he was remarried. By 1880, he had four or five more kids. Well, one of his kids was named William, who was actually had to be born in North Carolina. We think he may have been from the first wife. He was there but then he had some more kids by another lady. So what I think, or we think could have possibly happened, he had to be sold between 1863 and 1870, well, 1865. So we think because the war ended in 18, officially ended in 1865. So he had to be sold or he ran away. We don't know what happened, but it says that he was somehow connected to Alabama according to the 1880 census. It said he was born in Alabama, but I, I think he was really born in North Carolina. Mm. Um, and he came from Alabama to Florida. So a lot of our family ended up in Alabama and then they you know, started from North Carolina to Alabama and then to Mississippi and points south. So that's what we think happened with him. Um, but the Bacchus, we kept trying to figure out well, where did he get the Bacchus name? So we tried to look up Bacchus and we didn't have too much luck. There were some people with the last name Bacchus, but we couldn't make the connection. So on one of the wheels 
that we found of one of the McNeils that owned our family, there was a slave that would have been older than Gabriel, and his name was Bacchus. Oh. So we put, I began to put, kind of put two and two together. Well, Sherd, who was Sarah's husband, their children or their grandchildren, their name was Sherd B. McNeil. I kind of think that the B stands for Bacchus. Right. I think Gabriel may have been Gabriel Bacchus McNeil. And when he got down there, somehow the McNeil got dropped. Maybe. Okay. Or he took on the name of his uncle, because I think that Bacchus may be his uncle. He took on the name of Bacchus and uh and just put Bacchus on the back of his name. Uh, but again, you know, that's still questionable. But it's a very unique story um, in itself that that name Bacchus and that we found a slave that's probably his father's brother named Bacchus, and which is why some of them may have the B, the shirt B in their name. Um, one of them, I think we may have figured out that he may have been a ba shirt ba Balaam, Balaam, but we're not sure. Um, so that's one unique story. Is it, is it, isn't it kind of amazing? I don't know, amazing. There is some realism to all that because they had to, the, the slave owners had to pay tax on, on, on their slaves. They did. And that's how we were able to find some of them because it was listed in some of the tax records because they listed this actual slave and how much they were worth. Um, that's that's and, helped and, us and, and to, to say how much somebody worth that's really just an arbitrary number i say he's worth 50 bucks or is there do you think there was a standard of how much people were worth i'm not sure how they came to a price i mean yeah. some of the slaves i only i only assume that is how, how old they were and how especially with the males how strong they were and how good they were able to to work in the fields or work wherever they were working um and that's what i'm from what I can tell, uh, based on some of the wheels and deeds of some of the slave owners, I think that's probably how they came to that conclusion. Uh, can you imagine uh, this? How about how devastating is it? You 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 got your family, your mother right there, and then one day you're gonna they're gonna sell you off, yeah. and you got to conclude that you're never gonna see them again. Yeah. Yep. Now, one there's a story that I, I was going to tell earlier and I forgot. Um, so Sarah, born, she was born around 1800. Well, we could not find Sarah. We found Sarah in 1880. She was living with her son, Charles. So that's how we was able to put up most of that together because we knew Charles was her son. Well, we knew Charles would have been my, would have been Gabriel's brother. So we kind of put together uh, that we knew Sarah, we found her with him and it says mother. So we knew that that had to be his mother. So that was one of the ways that we was able to track her. She was born in 1800. Well, one of my cousins told me a story that uh, they heard of this old, old lady named Sarah. I mean, this is even before I even knew who Sarah was, that she walked back from Alabama to North Carolina. Um, and yeah, that's, the jury's still out on that, but uh, but she uh, allegedly walked back from Alabama. And, and obviously some people did walk or come back from Alabama uh, to North Carolina, uh, because we, we know that there's a connection between the people in Alabama and us. So what you're saying there is she was sold in, to Alabama and said once she was able to get her freedom or what have you, she, she went back to see her family. Yes, that's what we think. So she could have been sold with her son, Gabriel, because uh, he ended up in Alabama. Uh, but we that's something we really don't know um, unless we, we do have some wheels and deeds of quite a few of our family members that were sold uh, to people that went to Alabama. So, uh, but Gabriel and Sarah were not in any of them uh, at all, but who knows um, what happened. Let me and, and maybe you alluded to this earlier, and this is really what I had said earlier. Do you see some white person in your family, though? Uh, I know you said the people in Utah, but they, yeah, but they're not. They're not. They are. They are. The people in Utah are not. They're in the same situation we're in. It's not like they are. They were the slave owners. They just so happen to be. They're mixed, so they just happen to be 
a part of our family because one of our family members uh, got pregnant by one, another slave owner. So they're, they're not actually the slave owners, if that makes sense. Oh. However, if you look in some of our family members, uh, according to DNA, some of the lines say half. So that means they had a different father, most likely, from what we gather, or, or different. The likelihoods of them having a different mother is slim to none. Uh, but the having a different father, meaning meaning like there's one line, there's uh, one of our, my, I'm assuming she's my great, great, great aunt. So her, her when, when the DNA show up on her, it always show up as half. So that means Sarah had her by somebody else other than the husband with the, or the man that she had the rest of the kids by. So when you look at them, that line, you say, mm, whoever their father is, is white. You can really tell, first of all, you can tell the way, because the way they look. Number two, the DNA proves that they got connection to the white line. Wow. Line. So we have a couple of DNA matches that, you know, have this D, the white DNA. I don't have it as far as I know from that line, particular line. But again, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a 50-50 thing. Um, and we've talked to some of the people, uh, you know, a lot of the, um, the white people that I know now, that families that have uh, that were part of uh, owning our family, you know, they've been apologizing. I was like, "There's no need for you to apologize. There's nothing you could do. You know, you weren't there at that time. Right. You know, I'm just really grateful for the uh, for the fact that I have documentation that my family was here, and I can trace my family back to where you know, as far as 1775. Wow, a lot that of is you can't do that. A lot of African Americans cannot go that far back. Yeah, and no question. Have documentation. So you know, I'm grateful for that. And be believe it or not, a lot of the, the people you know have sent me stuff that they've collected from their family. You know, passed down. They one man sent me a whole book of family stories, and some of our people were in those stories, but I had no idea. He was so excited to be able to help us. Um, and he, you know, made a contribution to uh, my museum uh, that I have, or my resource center that I have. So he made a contribution there. So things like that, you know, mean a lot to me, as opposed to, you know, well, I'm mad at the white man because they, you know, they 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 held us in captivity. I mean, yes, they did, and it's, I mean that was 200 years ago, uh, and I'm moving past that now. Uh, I'm just so grateful to be able to see my family names in wheels. I mean, it's sad, but I see their names in black and white, so-and-so. And in -so. one wheel, which is very unusual, my own, my great-great-great-great, my fifth great-grandparents on the McLean side was uh, Jim and Lucy McLean. Well, when he died in his wheel, he lists all of his slaves. When he said, Jim, he said he's going to give John McLean to his son, Mike McLean, who is the son of Jim and Lucy. He's going to give Lucy, who is the daughter of Jim and Lucy, to somebody else. So that let me know that those were all their kids. So I was able to track all of their kids. I got you. And then obviously they were very young because it said at the end, and uh, John, uh, Jim and Lucy and their increase, that means there's a possibility they're going to have some more kids, and they probably did. And we were able to find uh, their kids. So one of their grandkids was named Grace. Grace McLean. Well, Grace McLean married a man by the name of Willis McCray. Uh, Willis McCray allegedly supposed to have lived to be 120-something years old. Uh, but in 1883, shortly after slavery was over, Willis McCray was supposed to have been, or at that time, was the only African, or one of the only African Americans in Harnett County that owned 650 acres of land. Mm. That spoke volumes for him. Um, he was on the Medearment Plantation, and when, he, when slavery was over, <laughs> the story is that all of the uh, people that were on that plantation changed their name from McDermott to whatever they wanted it to be because they, they said that man was so mean, they didn't want to have the McDermott name. 
So he changed his name to McCray because he remembers that was his mother's maiden name. She got sold off to Robeson County. When let me ask you this, as we kind of come to a close, almost okay. when when we talk about the, the, the people having names, is there a, an official naming record? You know what I'm saying? You know, like. I, I, you're named in your birth certificate. I don't, they didn't have birth certificates then. They had birth certificates. I mean, it 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 could vary. A lot of our people, fortunately, kept the same, you know, slave, slave name, you know, after slavery was over. I'm sure some of them changed the name, which is why we can't find a lot of them. Yeah, right. Uh, some of them, you know, may have moved away. Uh, and during that time, uh, the turpentine industry was a big thing here in North Carolina. So a lot of our people left North Carolina even before slavery was over, but definitely between 1880 and 1900 and went to Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, all those places because of the turpentine industry. What is that? The, turp <laughs> the turpentine industry was, they took the sap from a tree and it made what they call turpentine. And it also made tarp, tarp, uh, tarp, pitch and turpentine. So the turpentine, they used for different remedies to heal uh, different things. They drank it, they put it on their body um, and used it for ailments. Okay. The tarp was used to cork the ships. It was a big thing to cork the ships. So if the ship got a hole in it and you put that tarp on it, you will never have to worry about that hole again. So that was a really, really big industry in North Carolina. Um, and a lot of the slaves did that. I actually did the process. It was unbelievable. It was an all-day process just to get that much turpentine in a little bitty bottle. Um, and uh, it was interesting to see them do that, but that's what they did. Um, and that was a big, big industry here in North Carolina. No. Now, you, you alluded to earlier uh, that you have a, a museum or a resource center. I Tell us about that. All right, so my resource center here in Harnett County, which is in Lillington, uh, my resource center is located in Lillington. It has uh, tons of information in it, not just for Harnett County, but for various counties uh, around, around Harnett County. So my resource center uh, has books. It has uh, stuff I've collected for many, many years. We have a database of obituaries. Uh, from Harnett County and surrounding counties, we probably have two, 3,000 obituaries that you can actually come and look at um, and hopefully, you know, find some of your relatives. And if you want a copy of the obituary, we'll allow you to, you know, make a copy of it. Um, we also digitize the obituaries so that they're available online with the database. Mm -hmm. We have, you have access to ancestry.com where you can actually come and look up, you know, your family history. We have tons of pictures, uh, books, uh, genealogy books, church anniversary books. We have a database of African-American cemeteries from Harnett County and surrounding areas. Uh, we're working on, and I wish I had one. Oh, no, I got one right here. We, we just did this book right here. We right. did uh, 27 notable African-Americans in Harnett County, uh, some of the movers and shakers of Harnett County. My latest book is Let's Talk Genealogy for Kids. So it's like an interactive book. I love it. To do various uh, things. I love uh, it. Genealogy. Um, some of my other things I've done, I wrote a book about the McNeil story, which is a 463-page book. Ooh. It talks about from 18 or 17, 1775, uh, all the way to the present day. Um, it has pictures of family members in it. Uh, I've done one, several books, the Campbell story, the McNeil wow. story, the Holmes story. I'm getting ready to release another book called The Whale Story, which is my mom's side of the family. Um, hopefully in the next couple of, the next month or so, I'm also releasing an African-American, a Harney County African-American book that highlights the African-American community as far back as 1775, 17, as far back as wow. we, they have all of the graveyards. I've been to every graveyard just about uh, that I that we know of in Harney County. 
You, you, you have you won an award for what you do, or like a genealogy well, actually, award or something? I have last year. Last year, I uh, I'm a part of the Afro American Historical and Genealogical Society. So last year, I was able I was awarded. Um, last year, right. I was awarded the Virginia Humanities Scholars uh, Grant. Uh, and this was through the Afro-American Historical Genealogical Society Conference. Um, it was me along with about 20, uh, 19 other authors or people that had made That's significant, huge. Uh, significant uh, impact in genealogy of African-Americans. But the Resource Center, how do people get to it? Is there, I mean, is there a building well, where they come? A, uh, we have a website. We have a website. Uh, it's called w, it's www.africanamericanexperience.org. So, so people can donate to your center because it's you can donate to the center. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, they can donate do, via um, Cash App, and our Cash App is Harnet A A E. Yeah. Um, or they can go to our website and donate as well. We're gonna um, we're gonna put all that in the description. Everybody, this is what I do is strong. I'm telling you, I found the man. I found the man. This guy is an expert. I found the man, I don't know how I found him, but I did, and I'm so grateful that I did, and, and that he decided to come on Strong Inspirations and spend this time with telling us his family history back to the 1700s. I would like to know mine, and I'm, a, I, I, I'm intrigued by this. Everybody, come on, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button on this video, Hit the notifications bell. Tell somebody about strong inspirations, um, and and let's keep this keep this moving uh, uh, fast forward. Uh, to you, my brother, I say uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. It's Thank been a time. I say with all sincerity, I want you to stay strong, stay yes, safe, stay on your grind. I love what you're doing, uh, researching your family, helping other people research their family and then putting that center together so that people can do this research easily. And just just, just being the guy you are, man, I, I, I love it, my brother. And so uh, we're gonna, we, I'm gonna meet you one day. I, I promise you that. I, we're gonna, yes, I, I, I wanna meet you, shake hands. And so to, I just, hey, everybody, we, that's what we do here, uh, so much and so forth. Uh, my man, bye-bye, we out. All right, sir. Have a great day. Okay, you too. All right.